Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for being here. We're going to pick up where we left off. Next week, we start our series on the study of the book of Revelation 2012. The end is near. Hopefully, you're prepared for that. If you have your Bibles, go and turn with me to 1 John. The, not the Gospel of John, but 1 John. Go to the end of the book and turn left. You should run into it. 1 John chapter 1. And if you will, just once you've found it, keep it aside. We're not going to read our text immediately as I normally do. But if you found it, just set it aside and, and we'll get to it here soon. Last week, we talked about balance. That the secret to carrying burdens is balance. Spiritually, emotionally, relationally. One of the things that we laid out in, is spiritually that if you want to, we're all inclined one way or the other. If you were to, in your mind, lay out a scale in your own life, a, a continuum in your own life, and you put law on one side and place grace on the other, automatically you and I are wired naturally to go one way or the other. The issue is if we get unbalanced in how we're set up. Now, those who are naturally towards law you're the kind of person that you're like restraints galore. You know, this is, this is this, this is that, black and white. For those of you who are inclined more towards grace, you're, you're almost to the point of, of no restraints. Now, in this, there are two equal yet opposite errors that create unbalance. One unhealthy imbalance that occurs is when you constantly hop from one extreme to the other. When you guys know a lot of people, like, they're like bipolar Christians. One moment, anything goes, everything goes. But then the next moment, no, no, this is the law. And you, they're hard to live with. You, you, you don't know how to even address them because you don't know, are you, are you meeting, you know, Jekyll or Hyde that day? You don't, you don't know how it's going to work out. The other unhealthy balance that we find is not somebody who hops to and fro, but where they camp themselves to an extreme end. I mentioned we're all naturally one way, law or grace, but the error becomes when we go all grace and stay there. Then we tend to compromise. We, we have no standard by which to live by because we, we want to forgive everything. It's going to be okay, but the opposite, you know, the other extreme is if we're camped in law, and then it becomes our rules. We begin to push how we work on different things. You know, it's basically like the person, if, if a particular lady is all law if, if just naturally you're the type of person that is all law then you're the kind of person that you've got to make your bed every day and it's got to have that hospital corner in the end and if it's not perfectly then God is angry at you but then you have the opposite person that they might be so filled so far gone on grace that it's like we don't need to make the bed this month you know it's, the first type of person, they're going to end up in the loony bin if they're all law because that lack of perfection, perfectionism that exists. But the other person, they may not end up in, in the loony bin, but their spouse may end up in the loony bin. So we realize we've got to find balance. Now, balance comes in this way. We mentioned last week that we must grace the natural curve and bent of our lives. In other words, if we know that we're more towards the law, then we need to be sure and push ourselves towards grace. Likewise, if, we're, if we tend naturally, do our natural inclinations, if we're more towards grace, we need to push against the opposite way and allow ourselves to come into some balance. Now, last week I challenged you all to, to study yourself, to look at your own life, to analyze yourself. So I'm just curious what you found out if you truly inspected yourself. So we're going to just go ahead and do a quick test here today. Uh, just slip up a hand. That's all you need to do. You don't have to raise your hand unless you want to. But hey, we're family here. We did it in our full staff meeting, and it was interesting to see. It was almost 50-50 and see, seeing how people were laid out. So here we are. Those of you who just by examination of your own life you know beyond a shadow of doubt you tend your natural curve in your life is towards law. If that's you, just slip up a hand. Yeah, Pastor Glenn, it was almost up immediately, wasn't it? So, several hands. Yeah, okay. You may put it down. 
Those of you who just by looking at your own life, you know that you tend towards grace. If that's you, raise your hand. Hands all over the place. All over the place. Now, this is what I'm going to do. All the single people in the building, if you raise your hand for the first one, if you'll line up here. (laughs) And all the single people who raise their hand for the second one will line up here. We're going to match up, okay? Listen, one of the things that we talked about is that there is relationally is one of the ways that God enables us to grace the natural curves of our lives. Opposites attract. They attract. If we begin to dig back, we realize that one of the things that drew us together is that they fulfilled something that I lack or lacked, and they help grace us. If, I, if I'm, if I'm the, the, you know, the, the silent type, maybe the person we've been attracted to is, is louder than normal because they bring that balance. They fulfill something inside of us. But one of the errors that occurs is over time, as we're married and so many marriages break down and end up in disrepair, is because we turn around and that very thing that attracted us to them, we turn around and say, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. I'm no longer going to put up with, with them pushing me back this way. This is who I am. And therefore, we want them to stop gracing our life, and we want them to be just like us. God forbid. God forbid. We have to be able to allow the relationships around us to grace us one way or the other to help bring about a balance. So, Picking up from there, we're going to look at some things regarding theological balance. What are some of the hindrances to allowing God to bring us into balance? In other words, how do we actually resist God's balance for our lives? The first hindrance, this one's obvious, it is pride. It is pride. We resist God's efforts to bring us into balance because we end up stubborn and unteachable. We we turn around and say, it's got to be my way. Now, when we are out of balance, when we begin to move back into balance, we allow that natural oscillation to occur where it pushes us back. The closer, the, the more balanced we are, the clearer we can hear God's voice. Because when we decide to do it our way, our own natural way, when we encamp ourselves in a particular way, it is all about me. We allow pride to dictate. We see it in relationships. We see it in different areas where no longer do we want others to grace us, but it moves us in in, in a particular way that sensitivity to the Holy Spirit to bring balance to our lives. Pride, a lot of times, wants to, to rule any of God's work inside of us. First hindrance is pride. The second hindrance is self pity. The more self pity sits in, the more our actions and our perceptions become irrational. Now, I want you to know something. Self-pity and paranoia are divided by a very thin line. By a very, very thin line. Self-pity says, poor me. Paranoia says, poor me. Everybody hates me. Very thin line. Self-pity reacts against the efforts of God to bring us into balance through his events, through his word, through teaching, because self-pity claims even God is against me. You might remember uh, in the Old Testament, it is an interesting uh, passage that a lot of times we might not even notice, but in the book of Ruth, we're introduced to Naomi. Naomi is somebody who has lost everything. You all remember the story. She has lost her husband. She has lost her sons. Therefore, she has lost her income. And she is left with a Gentile daughter-in-law. She she gave the option to her daughter-in-laws and said, listen, I know this is a foreign land. You've you've been part of the family. Now you're no longer connected to me. But what happens? One of them turns around and says, you know what? Um, I'm going to stay with you. Now, there's nothing worse to a Jewish woman than to be stuck with her Gentile daughter-in-law. So she is now heading home with nothing and her Gentile daughter-in-law. She is making her way back home, and when she arrives there, one of Naomi's friends asks her, Are you Naomi? 
And she, in reply, does a play, uh, in Hebrew, she does a play on words and response there. She says, which by the way, Naomi means in Hebrew, full of blessings, satisfied, full, and complete. So somebody asks you, hey, aren't you Naomi? Aren't you the one who's blessed and, and full of blessing and complete? She says, no, my name is not Naomi. My name is Mara, which means bitter. She says, no, I'm not complete. I am a bitter woman because God Almighty has dealt with me bitterly. She was not able to receive the blessing of what God was about to do in her life because she was too busy blaming God for what had occurred. So we see pride sneaks in. It's a hindrance to balance. Self-pity can be a hindrance to balance. Another third uh, hindrance is self-centeredness. When we are caught up in our own self-centeredness, we become more and more bizarre in our actions. The fear of normalcy becomes greater and greater. Therefore, we resist its efforts to push us back towards the middle, to bring us into balance. Bizarre actions that fear normalcy are actually a cry for attention. You might know some of these people. They say, in essence, look at me. Look at my hair. Look at the way I act. Look at the way I dress. It is all about when they walk in, they want the focus on themselves. And if they don't have the focus, then they're going to do wilder and wilder things. Now, part of that is a natural certain, just basically a, a, an organic a phase that goes on in our life. There's nothing in the world like an adolescent girl. How many are parents here who have teenage girls? Wow, God bless and keep you. Because we see, listen, there's maturity that in and of itself will bring balance over time. Maturity says to himself or herself, yes, I want to look my best, but at the same time, I don't have to be the center of the universe. With, especially with, with teenage girls, they're dealing with the fact of they want to be themselves. They want to know who they are while trying to balance fitting in. So some of the phase things that go on is, this is who I am. Therefore, if I look this way, therefore, if I act this way, if I get in attitude, this is because this is who I am. But not recognizing that it is immaturity at its best. But we see over time, people need to grow up and mature in that. The issue is, we look around and we see a, a room full of, of adult people and some people here today never outgrew adolescence. They still make it all about themselves. They can end up in one end, whether they recognize it or not, they end up all shut up and, and closed up and they never matured in the process of, of being able to interact with others so they end up all reserved and you ask them how they're doing and they freak out. They don't know how to respond. They weren't able to, to grow up in the opportunity to interact with other individuals. On the opposite extreme, you have those who turn around and it was all about them. They, they always had to look this way, act this way. They still do. It is all about a flashiness, a, a flamboyance, if you will, in how they dress, their attitudes, their emotions. And it becomes wilder and wilder. As if every moment is a cry for attention. Maturity and balance helps bring all of that back into line. Very quickly in regards to self-centeredness. One of its greatest downfalls is a sensual spirit. See, because sensuality draws a great deal of pleasure in the attention of the opposite sex. Therefore, one of the things that, you know, I've been able to come to the conclusion about those people who are always self-centered, especially some ladies, they begin to exude sexuality. What it is is a lack of maturity in a particular area. Now, just because I say sensuality, I'm not implying that they automatically are all sexually immoral. No, that is one of its eventual downfalls. But what happens is some ladies who were never able to find acceptance growing up, being able to, to feel completed, they then, whether they realize it or not, in that immaturity, 
find themselves needing to do things to themselves to create and capture the eyes of the men around them. It's the type of person whose sweater is just too tight, whose clothes, whose everything is to look at me, finding gratification in the need for the acceptance or at least the looks of the men around. Now listen to me if that is you. What, does, what matters not is what men think of you. What matters is the realization that you are a daughter of God Almighty and he accepts you just the way you are. <laughs> Besides, if the only guy you can attract is by showing your cleavage, then if somebody's cleavage is more than yours, he's gone. So why don't you allow that person to know who you are for the inside and let the outer part be the bonus that God has when you enter into marriage? So there's got to be a balance, and the reality is if that sensuality is not placed into check, it will lead then to sexual immorality, even though that may not be the initial intent. So self-centeredness is a hindrance. The fourth and last hindrance is insecurity. Attempts to bring me into balance are more threatening the less balanced I am. Anybody ever hop into a canoe? You remember the first time you ever got into a canoe? It is so funny to watch people. They step in and they're like, whoa. Because the canoe works in such a way it is going to have a natural oscillation on the water. And people who aren't used to it freak out every time. Because they step into it and it moves and they think they're automatically going to go, you know, swim with the fishes because of it. So any natural movement makes that person nervous. It makes that person all panicky. The more insecure we are, the moment God nudges us, we tend to react more. There is a litmus test that you can see. When, when you hear a sermon or you hear a particular teaching and a point is made that you may not agree completely with, but it's not some wild, uh, heretical thing. It's not some off-base thing. It's just something that you just, you think about it in a different way. You, you see it differently, and when you hear it, and you feel yourself just beginning to react against it strongly, it just infuriates you unnecessarily, then you are out of balance. There is something that is unbalanced about you. There is a pastor that I know who was confronted by a particular member who turned around and said, you know what, I am just tired. All this church, all you ever preach about is money, money, money. The pastor was shocked because he keeps, like me, he keeps a, a calendar diary of, of what he's preached and how it's laid out. It's all planned out, and he only remembered once that you're actually doing it. And, but he was willing to turn around and say, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, well I'll, I'll watch that. So, pastor intentionally for the next 12 months did not bring up money in, in a sermon. Of course, they took up offering. They had special, did not bring up money in, in his preaching. 12 months later, did a stewardship thing, calling everybody to accountability. And that guy was the first one to meet him as soon as it was done and said, you see, I told you, all you ever preach about is money. Pastor looked at him and said, you know what? You're right. So, why don't you go find somewhere else? I'll pray for your pastor. You see, there are those things that you and I bring into it where we naturally go a particular way, and if somebody challenges it, we need to watch how we react to it. Because it is actually not pointing out a flaw in somebody else, it's pointing the unbalance in you. We're, whoa! Remember, we think we're the most balanced people in the room. Everybody to the left or right of me, they're the ones who are unbalanced when you're the one not even looking at yourself. We've got to be able to step back and look. The more unbalanced we are, the more insecure we can be, the more threatened we become. 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 6. I want you to... 
take note, just like we did last week, I want you to see the oscillation in Scripture that occurs, the, um, the seeming contradictions, conflicts of going back and forth that are found in, in this passage. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no peace, no place in our lives. Chapter 2, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have become, we have come to him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet, I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Isn't that a fascinating passage of Scripture? You can take that, that set of verses, those few verses, and you can make 20 different denominations if you wanted to. You honestly could. Because all you have to do is line yourself up with whatever or whichever verse you prefer. There are several churches that have very small Bibles that have gone through and picked and chosen what they prefer. Some extreme holiness churches focus, if you will, chapter 2, verse 1. They read, my dear children, I write this to you so you will not sin. And they stop there. Now, does Scripture say, does it say that you're not supposed to sin? Correct. It does say that. So, Somebody who wants to just take that passage and not use balance, I want you to follow the progression that can occur if you're not careful. If you are a Christian, you will obey God. Okay. If you obey God, you won't sin. Therefore, if you sin, what? You're not a Christian. You see the progression that you can easily lose yourself in this. The problem is it leaves out the second half of the verse. It leaves out. See, the apostle John is not at all embarrassed about the need for balance here. He says we are all called to righteousness, not to sin. However, if you sin, it doesn't mean that the whole thing is blown up to pieces. Don't go out and hang yourself in a moment of sin. Ask God for forgiveness. On the other hand, move forward towards perfection. However, if you don't see perfection, if you aren't walking in the light all the time, then ask for God's grace to help you. On the other hand, God has sent his son Jesus to forgive us of our sins. And if we say that we've never sinned, we make God out to be a liar. So if we go on in deliberate, intentional sin, time and time again, we are in rebellion against God. If we're, if, if, you know, there's nothing new in the Old Testament that says that God is holy, therefore we should be holy. However, there is a new commandment because in, in the New Testament, the law will no longer be carved on tablets of stone. It will then be placed in your hearts. And God is going to work with you on this. Therefore, just as Jesus walks and he works in you, you are going to walk in holiness even as he walked. Do you see the beautiful balance? 
that is made available there. If you only read half of the verse, you're going to end up in terrible theological error one way or the other. One side turns around and says, oh, sin, 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 sin. Do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. God's going to forgive you. You can live like hell and sneak into heaven at the end. You understand? Now, on the other hand, we find the lash of legalism. If you sin, you're doomed. You are doomed. And what happens? We end up convincing ourselves that, no, no, I didn't sin. I know if I sin, I'm in trouble, so I can't do that. So therefore, no, that wasn't sin. I, that was just, okay, I'm just moving on. And John says, if you sin and deny that you have sinned, you're walking in darkness. When we attempt to seek theological balance in our lives, I want you to understand this. We must remember that it is a lifetime spiritual journey. It is not, bam, you prayed, now you're in balance. It's not, bam, I've made it, now I'm here forever. For your lifetime, you need to allow yourself to oscillate and find yourself in balance. Every one of us believes that we're the most balanced person. We're the most balanced theologian in this place. Everybody else is the one who's unbalanced. Now, I by no means am perfect, but for years I have tried my best to seek and to apply that which is balance. So here are a few things that I want to share with you that I found in Scripture regarding balance. One, make sure you know the difference between true balance and false balance. There's true balance and false balance. For every theological truth, there is balance. A true balance, but there is also a false balance. Take, for example, the sermon's not about this, but take, for example, faith and hyperfaith. Faith and hyperfaith. If I make faith the center of my theology, then I have to reinforce my faith time and time again. And what happens if I'm not careful, I will push it so far into an extreme that I will burst through the wall and end up in grave error, grave theological error. An evangelist from Georgia was visiting church in Alabama, and they were having a fellowship moment, and they were done with it, but they were all talking around. It was a, a, an old uh, Pentecostal charismatic place, and you know, they were about to go into service, uh, and some of the people were coming, some of the young people were helping fold up the, the tables and putting them up, and one of the young people, as he folded the table, it slipped his hand, and I don't know if you've ever been around when those wooden things hit the floor, it was like, bam, made everybody jump. It just so happened that the, the visiting evangelist was right beside it, and it scared the living daylights out of him. He said, whoa, whoa, young man, you nearly scared me to death. And in that moment, instantly, about 14 charismatic people came around and said, uh uh, uh, uh. now listen here, preacher, we didn't bring you here to speak death in this place. <laughs> What's happened to us? What in the world has happened to us? If we aren't careful, we're going to turn the truths of God into a charismatic parlor game. See, there is an issue. There is an issue of positive and negative confessions. It is much, much better to have a positive confession than a negative one. But on the other hand, it's not the be-all and end-all of all theological revelation. Man was hesitant. He was not feeling very well, but he knew he couldn't make it through the rest of a particular meeting, and he was on his way out, and passed a, a friend of his. His friend saw him and said, hey, how you doing? He went, oh, I'm okay. He realized something was wrong. He said, oh, really? What, what's wrong? He goes, oh, I'm, you know, just, you know. The other guy goes, why are we whispering? The guy said, well, I just can't say, you know, you know, you know how it is. Yeah. We become such phony balonies, we can't even speak the truth in love. If you don't feel good, you don't feel good. God knows it, 
but we become so ashamed that maybe brother or sister so-and-so is going to cry out that we have no faith. Really? We've got to not be afraid to speak the truth in love. Now, you see, the issue becomes if we get so out of balance with faith, 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 the question becomes, is faith my God? Is faith my God? Well, faith is not my God. There has to be an object of my faith. My faith must be in God, not in faith. My, my faith is not in my positive confession. Now, here's the thing. Some people turn around and say, okay, so how do we balance faith? How do we balance faith? Oh, you know what? I know how to do this. You know, there's always this faith thing. You, you know what we need in this church? We need a little doubt. That's what we need in here. If we, if we don't watch out, we can get carried up. See, doubt is a false balance. We know that we might end up here. Well, bringing in doubt to hyperfaith does not balance it out. You don't balance faith with doubt. You balance faith with the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. I have faith. Now, I'm, I'm going to speak and live positive, positively. I'm going to believe. But the bottom line is that God runs this universe and not my tongue. He's the one in control. God speaks life into existence, not you, amigo. God's the one. And that is a very important issue to remember. There's got to be balance. Now, I believe in the power of faith. It parts the seas. It brings life to the dead. It even shuts the mouths of lions. But on the other hand, in the book of Hebrews, it says, by faith, some were tortured. By faith, some were cut in half. By faith, some died. By faith, some lived in caves in solitude. By faith. But the issue is that the balance of faith is the sovereignty of God. We have to balance one with the other. If you don't, if say you end up all on the sovereignty of God, and yeah, that faith stuff, no, I just, it's, it's whatever God's way, God's will, you know, I'm stuck on the sovereignty of God. If we don't allow some balance in there, and you end up in some confusion, you're going to make the mistake known as double predestination. Now, if I don't have time to fully go into it, but you can call the church. Extension 115, Dave Dedimore will answer all your questions. <laughs> With the predestination, it's basically the, the theology that some are chosen to be in heaven and some are automatically chosen to be in hell. So how we live, how we react, all that honestly doesn't matter because it's already been chosen. So if we end up all on the sovereignty of God, that God's will overrules everything, I don't, I don't need to trust, I don't need to believe, we end, up, we end up condemning ourselves. John Wesley said this way, speaking of Calvinism and predestination, he said, if you believe in predestination, everybody is doomed. Some are doomed to hell and some are doomed to heaven, but they're all doomed. What balances then the sovereignty of God? What balances the sovereignty of God is the fact that you and I are free moral agents. We have a free will. We get to choose. You see how it works? We have to be careful not to put in the wrong thing. We've got to get true balance. Take for the example of sanctification. Yes, I am called to move on in perfection, to walk in holiness, and to overcome sin. Is that right? Yes. But there must be a balance to it. Sin is not the balance to your pursuit of holiness. Some people can end up with a false balance. Well, you can become so consumed with holy, holy, holy. Well, what we need in this place is a little sin. That's a false balance. And it will lead to terrible error and even more sin. There's got to be a balance to the pursuit of holiness. The true balance to the pursuit of holiness is grace. I'm going to pursue 
holiness, to pursue perfection, believing God for it. But in those moments where I fail, thank God for the blood of Jesus. Thank God for his blood. I know I'm running out of time. Briefly, one of the things I want to pinpoint, the balance of spiritual authority. As, as a congregation, we turn around and we automatically, whether we recognize it or not, we turn around and our, our pastors, especially the lead pastor, we want that person to have heard from God, correctly? Yeah, we, we want to be able to know, okay, they have heard from God that we're going this way. They, you know, we want those particular moments you've seen in Scripture where the pastor comes, raises his staff, the water divides, woo, we cross the, the land on dry, you know, dry ground. We like that kind of stuff. We want, we want to be able to, to come and expect the pastor to have heard straight. We want that angel with the flaming sword in his hand, and he said, go this way. We want the pastor to come and burn with that conviction. The issue is that's maybe happened once or twice in my lifetime. Yet, as people, we turn around and we want that to happen all the time. See, there are moments just like you where God clearly speaks a word and we move on. There are other moments where I must seek God. But having not heard from him, having gathered as much information as possible, I can come and say, I have heard from the Lord, I think. I've searched and I've sought, and he's saying east. Well, at least it sounded like east to me, okay? Furthermore, last year we went west, and we ended up in trouble going west, so we're now headed east. The people, though, they want, just like Aaron, to bring his rod and his staff and to see a miracle, just something growing on the staff. We want to look at the pastor and expect the same thing time and time again. But here's the reality. I can't operate that way. Your pastors are still human. So we have to humbly come and seek God in all of this. We can't. See, the temptation is if that's the people's cry, show us a sign, do something, dance, monkey, dance, then it's up to us to turn around and fabricate a miracle. Because the temptation is to give in to manipulation. And that's unacceptable. So how do you balance spiritual authority? How do you balance? It's not with manipulation. You balance spiritual authority with genuine meekness, humility, and genuine transparency. Saying, folks, this is where God's called us. This is where I feel God has called us. Hop on board. It's going to be bumpy, but it's going to be a blast. Very quickly, five keys to theological balance. Very quickly. Five keys. I've given you five. uh, Earlier, I gave you four. Areas of hindrance, let's give you five theological balances. One is the fruit of the Spirit. You need to pray constantly to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. We see the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But the fruit in and of itself is balanced. The joy that we feel sometimes can be balanced with peace in the midst of the storm. Love then. Through the, through the fruit of the Spirit, leads to self-control, which, by the way, is another word for balance. So one of them is the fruit of the Spirit. The second is the whole counsel of God. You may not believe this or not, but I can prove anything in the world using the Bible. You name it, any kind of heresy, I can prove that the world is flat. I can prove that certain people were destined to be slaves, but... What do I do? I have to isolate scriptures and pull them, torture, and abuse them so that they come to my advantage. But I have refused and rejected the whole counsel of God. Any time, listen to me, any time you hear somebody shout from any stage or any platform and declare that God has given them a brand new revelation, God has shined through and they have something brand new, some brand new revelation, if you are there, grab your Bible in one arm, grab your wallet in the other, and run from that place. Run, I dare dare say, run. Study the whole Bible. 
verses that are taken out of context used to say one thing or another, it's not only deceptive, it is sinful. Third key, do not be ashamed of using your own reason. I don't know why the modern Pentecostal charismatic movement has been so at odds with its own intellect. Don't be afraid to use the brain God has given you. Use it. When somebody down the road comes with some wacky, idiotic, new doctrine or something, don't be afraid to look at that brother in the face and say, listen to me, I love you, but that's just stupid. (laughs) Don't be afraid to stand up for it and say, I'm not buying into it. There's nothing wrong with that. Say the truth out of love, okay? Do as I say, do as I try to tell you, not as I literally just told you, okay? <laughs> Look at them out of love and say, listen, I'm not buying it. That is against God's word. That is against the natural order of things. You just might be used to save that life and not be lost. Fourth, this one might be surprising to some of you. You must have a sense of of humor. I believe that a sense of humor is one of God's great, greatest gifts to cushion us from the things that otherwise would cause us to crash through the wall one way or the other. Sense of humor is not only finding what's funny in an incident. Many people can find what's funny in an incident and not have a sense of humor. A sense of humor is to see what's funny in you. You must have the ability to laugh at yourself. Listen to me. Winter's coming. If you are surrounded by a bunch of people that you love and you're maybe on an incline and you slip and you fall all the way down, beat everybody to the punch and laugh first despite the pain. <laughs> laugh first. If you say something wrong, laugh about it. If you're so fragile that you can't see when you've just goofed up, then you'll have no balance, no resiliency, no humor in life. See, one of the funniest things in the world is you. Listen, I can prove to you, I can prove to you that God has a sense of humor. Just go ahead and look at the person to your left and to your right. Now listen to me. If those around you Laugh the loudest while looking at you. You might want to check yourself out. <laughs> now, let me, let me close with this one. If you missed last week, you have just now woke up because my voice drove you into sleep and the laughter woke you up. If all you get is this, I want you to write this down. The key to balance is to submit to the work of the cross. Jesus, keep us near the cross. A healing stream flows from Calvary. It heals with balance and it heals with maturity. It accepts the natural movement in our lives, being patient with it in others. See, it's not the portrait, uh, uh, the proper portrait of a follower of Jesus to be upright to be all bent out of frame, to be stressed out, to be argumentative and stuck on right. Some of you people just won't allow anybody to say into you, anything into your life because you've got to be right. I challenge you, for the next month, just keep your mouth shut and let others try and bring some balance to your life. You don't always have to be right. The work of the cross is to plant that destruction of self, the ego, the pride, the anger. And as the work of the cross begins to destroy it, it is painful because it's less of us. But there is also healing that flows from Calvary that brings us into a safe walk with him. Jewelry store had a credible sale on crosses they had some necklaces and different things like that. It was some gaudy things that were all laid out. And they had a little label beside all these crosses. Once your eyes got off all the shininess, the sign actually said, these crosses on easy terms. You know, I could fill a church with that. Reality is, 
The cross is not on easy terms. Jesus fought everything inside of him for self-preservation. Lord, if you can, take this cup from me. But he knew that in stepping into self-preservation, you and I, every one of us, would be doomed for all eternity. And he gave in despite the pain, despite the beatings, despite the piercings, so that you and I would have life. Go and stand with me right where you are and let's pray. Heavenly Father, right now we are a people that need balance. Father, every one of us, if we were honest with ourselves, we need balance. Some of us lose our way. Some of us ground ourselves and we say we're not moving from here. But every one of us needs balance. Some of us, Lord, we've been caught so much under the law side and we get so legalistic with things. We get so argumentative, but we also get so fake because we can't admit. We know that the law condemns us, so if we fall, we're condemned, and therefore we act as if we have never fallen. And Lord, your scripture clearly lays out that we not only are liars, but we make God out to be a liar. Lord, but on the other hand, there are some of us here today that we just keep living so much under grace. It doesn't matter what I do that I can keep doing whatever I want, living for the day, and with that, I still make you out to be a liar because I need a little law in my life to balance me out. Beloved, with right where you are, if you could just be honest with me, if you can slip up a hand and say, John, pray with me right now. Before we dismiss, I need balance in my life. Listen, my hand's up. I need some balance. Uh, there are areas in my life, maybe relationally, emotionally, spiritually, I need balance. I've recognized throughout these past couple of Sundays, I need to work in some areas. So will you all join me if you're not already doing so? Slip up both hands towards heaven. And for those of you who are visiting, you may not be used to this. This is just a sign of surrender, saying, okay, God, I'm, I'm giving up. I'm going to give you access. And right where you are, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, right now, I need you. God, I need you. Holy Spirit, continue to move in my life. Bring balance to me where I, nor I, now I normally, naturally move this way. I need you to pull me the other way. Lord, I pray right now for those of us who have filled our lives with false balance. I pray that you remove it under the power of the Holy Spirit. Take it from us. Lord, I don't want to I don't want to serve at a church full of fake people. I want to serve at a church recognizing that I am nobody but God. So Lord, you're the one doing a work in me. It is through your might, through your power. So continue to mold me. Continue to make me in your image. I don't want to just live in adolescence forever, but mature us, Lord. Allow us to grow in you. Allow us to find the fullness that is in you, Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, I now pray if there are those here in this building that recognize the lack of balance in their life is because they don't know you, I pray right now that they just cry out to Jesus. Simple as that, Lord, we cry out to you. Jesus, fill me now. Replace that which is a void. Replace all of my wrongdoings, all of my sin that has gone against you. And I'm not asking for religion. I just want a relationship with the almighty God right now. So just cry out to him. Say, I'm sorry. In your heart, begin to confess. Say, I'm sorry. Make me new. Listen, Scripture says, we're all sinners. But God loved us just the same. Even while we were yet sinners, he sent his son to die for us. So, Lord, we accept you now. Fill us. Move us in your direction. I pray that new beginnings start right now. I pray that proper balance, the move for the rest of our lives, be brought in attention to your balance. But, Lord, we cannot do it at our own might. Holy Spirit, breathe upon us. Lead us. Bring order to that which lacks order. In Jesus' name, extend your hands this way and allow me to bless you. May the God of life and life more abundantly, may his grace cover you and may his law direct you. May both be kept in your heart. May it balance you no matter the storms of life, no matter the valleys you face. May you continue to move forward in the moments where you continue in him and you find yourself falling short. May his grace, his 
his love cover you. In the moments where you find yourself getting so loose, may his law bring you back in recognition that he has paid the price for your sin. So I now bless everybody with extraordinary victory. I bless them now to lifelong, uh, lifelong living in proper balance. I ask this now in Jesus' sweet and almighty name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you all.